Okay, I'm gonna get started. Um, my name is Megan Graham. I'm an advertising and marketing reporter um, for CNBC.com. Um, and today I'm gonna show a little bit about uh, an experiment that I did last month um, and ended up writing about. Um, so I have a presentation and um, I'll kind of just walk through this experiment that I did, um, talk about maybe some takeaways. Um, and then obviously if there's questions, please you know, just let me know at the end. I'm happy to um, get into anything I didn't get into in the presentation, or obviously if you have kind of stories of your own to share, I'd love to hear them. Um, so I'm just gonna share my screen. Hopefully you can see this okay. Um, so about two months ago, I was um, looking for a story that had just gone up. We'd had Barry Diller come on our air and he kind of shared some interesting things about their ad spend. And I wrote up a quick story and then I was Googling to just grab the link really quick so I could tweet it. And I, I came across this link um, and I was like, oh, this is weird. This looks just like my headline. And I clicked on it and saw it had a similar picture and it was on this site the New York Times Post. Um, and this site had all sorts of other CNBC stories on it and, and sort of ripped in full stories from other publications. Um, and, and running legitimate advertisements from, you know, a number of ad tech partners. Um, so, you know, I just thought this was interesting. I'd heard about these before. BuzzFeed has kind of done a great job of writing about this, um, this trend. But you know, given everything happening in the publishing industry during COVID, it's been just a, a really difficult time for publishers and publisher revenue. I just thought, you know, this would be a good time to take a step back and, and look at this and how it happens and, and you know, how, how rampant of an issue is it? So before long, I tried making my own. Um, and this, this, is a, this is from GoDaddy. This is my um, domain um, that I bought, the Tribune Times Today. Um, I registered it to be private so that, you know, a lot of these guys will be stay private so you can't get their name or contact info. Um, and then I just kind of describe here um, just some of the things that you needed to do to set up, which kind of, you know, maybe some of this stuff looks tricky, but it was so easy. I mean, I, I was able to do all of this in sort of a matter of of hours, really. I mean, buying the domain, setting up a Gmail address, um, you can get a burner um, phone app that just, you know, for free or for very cheap, um, you can kind of communicate via that text. And that I just would use for, um, to fill out contact forms and stuff. Um, setting up an SSL certificate so that you get an HTTPS connection. Um, and then I used WordPress plugins to scrape content um, and then, you know, I was kind of looking at Google AdSense blogs just to see what are some of the things um, they say you should have in place um, if you're trying to get approved. And a lot of them said, you know, make sure you have your GDPR, CCPA pop up um, so that, you know, it looks like a legitimate site. So, so those things I did too. And you can just find those things online, just boilerplate language. It didn't mean that I was necessarily doing any of those things, but it's very easy to set up. And then, of course, content. And so um, I, this is the site, this is the Tribune Times today. Um, and so, as you can see, there's just stories and I kind of just would, I'll show you some of the scraper mechanisms that I use, but um, just grabbed CNBC stories in full. Um, and it's very easy to do. Um, you can use things like this, the Scraper Pro or the, um, this is just the Scraper Pro, kind of shows you. So you can either put in an RSS feed link and just grab full stories. And, and a lot of these guys will also, I say guys, but you know, whoever it might be behind the sites, um, will just scrape the photo as well. And I just wanted to be really cautious about that just because, you know, you may, may or may not know this, but you know, publications typically work with um, photo, companies to license those pictures. And I really wanted to be careful about that. So I just used my own pictures or I would, you know, use pictures that I was allowed to use, um, just stock imagery that I would just use for the story. So 
Um, so I just would grab a story. Sometimes if you use the scrapers, you have to kind of manually go through and put in paragraphs. Otherwise, it's just a whole big block of text. But there were some posts that just had a huge big block of text. Um, so that didn't look great. But, you know, some of them, if you go to these sites, that's, that's what some of these stories look like. So once I had about, I'm going to say 50-ish posts, that's kind of what they say is like you want at least 30. And then I would add more every day just to kind of make it look like it was constantly being refreshed. I started applying to um, different ad tech partners. So I, um, about 30, I'm going to say, um, and some of these were kind of like pop under networks where I really didn't, it didn't take any time at all to get approved. Um, the ones I'm going to talk about today are the ones that I was more interested to see just because they, they are more, they're well respected in the industry. And I was more surprised um, about seeing that I was approved. Um, so these are just the um, notes that you would get from different groups. So you would just fill out some information, you fill out contact info, um, fill out, um, you know, they'd sometimes ask you about revenue or traffic. Um, and then they'd often, as you can see here, will give you a bit of code just to put on your website. So they'd say, you know, put this in so that we can verify that you own the site. Um, and then kind of they would do their own diligence and check out the site. Um, and here's my approvals from these three. Um, and as you can see, I originally got denied from Sovereign and then they ended up not long after um, approving the site, which was interesting. So this is the other piece of it that I thought was interesting. I mean, once you get approved by a partner, they give you language to put on your ads.txt file. Um, which just means that these are the these are the entities that are authorized to sell my ad inventory on my website. Um, so this doesn't necessarily at all mean that these companies would sell the inventory, but it's just interesting, I think, because you know often when you look at a scammy site, you might look at the ads.txt, and that is just you know it's interesting. You're kind of like, well, why are these all listed here if you know, if this is not a legit site, and this is kind of how it happens, is if you get approved by a partner, they say, okay, we'll also run you up through these resellers. Um, and those resellers will often do their own due diligence about which URLs are accepted um, by them. So for instance, like Rubicon project was listed in here, but when I talked to Rubicon, they said, you know, once we would get this URL through InfoLinks or whoever other partner, we do our, we, you have to go through our other steps to make sure before we would ever sell um, that inventory from the site. So this is the AdSense reply. Um, and Google had taken a while to get back. Um, I was kind of kept checking and checking and they finally got about an, a week and a half after applying, um, sent this and they said, as you can see, uh, scrape content. So it basically says, you know, you're, you're scraping or rewriting content without really adding value. Um, and people that I talked to really said, this makes a lot of sense. Google probably has the most sophisticated, you know, web crawling. So they're, they're going to be the one to catch if, if you're ripping off stories in full um, from, a, from a legit publisher. So I was very heartened to get this answer because um, it just made me, you know, clearly they were looking for it. And even though there are sites that are monetized by AdSense, um, you know, I was doing this so blatantly and off the cuff. It wasn't that I had, you know, maybe these other sites start out by using their own original content, get, get approved by AdSense, and then switch over to be doing plagiarized content. But luckily, in this instance, with the plagiarized content and only plagiarized content, this didn't get past them. So, it was interesting. Um, here's a couple just examples of um, some of the ads that came through. I, I really, for the purposes of this experiment, wanted to be really careful about taking legitimate advertiser, um, you know, impressions. So I really only would kind of 
turn them on really quickly for a couple minutes at once and just see what was coming through. I did that a few times just to kind of see, um, and then I would switch them back off. So this really was not a, let's see how much money I can make um, kind of thing. This was just more to see if the ads would actually come through. Um, and here's just a couple examples of them. Um, so when I went to the companies just about why would I have gotten approved? Why did this happen? You know, they basically all ran through their processes for um, approving domains. Um, you know, Sovereign mentioned, you know, we're tag platinum certified, we're stricter than most. Um, even if something does slip through the cracks, we do regular audits to make sure that the sites in our network are legit. Um, Infolinks talked about, you know, we, we do a human review to make sure that um, we catch the most egregious stuff. Um, and then from there, you know, we might approve you, but you would only be eligible to show sort of beginner ads. So those are going to be like a little bit more performance based, a little less brand safety sensitive, if that makes sense. Um, and media.net said they also kind of um, will prelim preliminarily allow certain sites um, to show ads, but they would never get to pay out. That is what they said, is that, you know, you might be showing ads for a month or two, but if you ever try to cash out, we wouldn't allow that if we determined that you were not legit um, and we would return that revenue back to the advertiser. So that does, I think, raise some other questions about um, brand safety and, you know, even if you might not end up having to pay for that, it, are you as an advertiser okay with um, your advertising showing up on a site like this, um, just from a brand safety perspective? So this, I think, just to, to show how this kind of all works through a different lens, um, the Global Disinformation Index does some really interesting research um, to figure out how much money um, disin dis disinformation is making online. Um, and they just did this report in May and studied a handful of different um, conspiracy theories and stories about conspiracy theories. So you can see, I just grabbed from their report. So things like that COVID was purposely unleashed for population control or that 5G is causing COVID-19. So obviously, I don't think many would disagree that this is harmful information. Um, however, it is being monetized um, by a bunch of ad tech partners. You can get more information on their website. They have sort of the full report and everything. Um, but you know, for brands like HBO, Amazon, Best Buy, um, showing ads on these sites and monetizing them. So it's just, it kind of just shows you that even if this is kind of a different flavor of what I was doing, but it still shows you that no matter what kind of site, it's still quite easy to get approved. And that, you know, even if you are denied by a handful of partners, if you get in through one way, like it's just easy to slip through different cracks. Um, and you can just find, I mean, sites like this have tons of advertising on them. So it just kind of shows the different ways that, um, that, this, can, that this can happen. So I think, you know, for, for this experiment, I, I had some people after my story went up just sort of say, you know, well, who cares? Like your site wasn't making money. You weren't taking tons of money away from legitimate advertisers. Um, but I think I would challenge anyone listening to this to, to do your own experiment and um, grab just a little bit of text from a, a story that's being widely shared and see, just put it in quotes, go to Google, and I would say, you know, maybe keep it to two sentences or something, and see how many places have ripped off that story. And just then try to, in your mind, think, okay, if this is on 30 different websites, just imagine how many of these sites are out there. And even if they aren't getting a whole tremendous amount of traffic, um, you know, these people can set up these sites automatically and do this at immense scale and each bring in maybe a little bit of revenue, um, but it does add up. And I don't think there's any way for us to ever fully calculate how many of these sites there are, but there are, are so many. It's, it's just, it's crazy. 
Um, and the other thing that I really didn't get into, which is kind of just a different issue in and of itself, is I didn't buy fake traffic. I wasn't um, artificially amplifying traffic to my site. So I could have bought bot traffic. I could have um, set up social media accounts for my site and then amplified that which has this added benefit of making traffic look more legitimate because it's both maybe coming from bots as well as legitimate human traffic um, through social media. Um, you can also, <laughs> this is, I've, I've seen a bunch of reporters this week mention that they've caught stories like this, but you can also run your language through sites to kind of, you know, it kind of acts as a thesaurus, so it just makes it kind of into gibberish makes it harder for um, harder to catch plagiarism. And the other point is that, you know, you can set up a site that is completely legitimate, get it approved, and then only once you have been approved and maybe have built up, you know, a, a bunch of, uh, I don't know, goodwill, but just appearing to be legitimate for, for a while, then you can switch and start running, you know, fake news, harmful content, whatever you want. And it's tough to tell um, how many of the sites that are out there now went that route, but I can see how it could be really easy. And I'm not sure how um, well they can get flagged after the fact once they're already kind of running. So I think, you know, this just brings up a ton of questions about um, not just plagiarism, but just our ad tech system. Um, and how programmatic works and the amount of, um, you know, the amount of work that goes into ensuring um, that stuff like this doesn't happen. And I really do think, you know, there's lots of groups that are trying. Um, it just, I think this shows, helps show how many cracks, how easy it is to fall through the cracks. Um, so I think, you know, for ad, from the ad tech company perspective, just talking to folks after the story went up, you know, I, I was struck by how quickly the approval process went. Um, what would happen if, you know, you had to wait a couple weeks or jump through a couple more hoops? Um, I didn't have any, you know, human conversations to get through these three. To, to get advertising, I didn't have to talk to, any, to anybody. Um, some places would, would reach back to me and say, hey, can we set up a Skype call? Can we, um, can we, you know, email back and forth? Can you send me your Google Analytics and things like that? And I didn't go further with those because I just was more curious about the ones that didn't care. So I think that that would be one thing that would really prevent a lot of these from getting through. Um, I talked to a couple too that said, you know, we really look at the length of domain ownership. So if you haven't owned a domain for six months, we're never gonna let you through. So all these things that maybe would require more time or a little bit more work or a little bit more human review, I think all of those things are things that make it harder for these guys to get, to get in the mix. Um, and I do think you have to kind of ask yourself, you know, why would I, like with all this immense scale, is that worth it? I mean, if you, you, you might be able to get on such and such sites for, for a certain price, um, is it worth it to you as a brand or as a partner if that price comes at the potential for appearing on something like this and indirectly funding um, material like this? Um, I think then for you know brand advertiser, anyone else along the chain, I, it, it just kind of comes to um, you know the partners that you work with and are you gonna to continue to work with partners where you're seeing that the stuff is happening? Um, can you look at all the URLs you're on? I mean, if you're, if you're on hundreds of thousands of websites, do you think you really wanna be on those websites? I think it's just, a, it kind of presents a really interesting question of, do you need that skill? And is it worth it if you can't fully vet everything um, that you're on? And honestly, just the responsibility question is, is interesting. Who is responsible and I think you know, some say, well, it's the supply side. Some say it's the advertising. It just, it's, it presents all these questions, but I think at the end of the day, we all have to think about, when I say we, in the advertising industry, think about how, if it's coming through you somehow, um, you got to think about the partners that you work with um, and where your own money is going. And, you know, until that, until this is sort of plunged better, prevented, um, 
you know, this is going to continue to happen because it makes a lot of money. Um, so here's my info. Um, you know, if you ever have questions about this or have, you know, want to talk about something happening um, or have ideas of other things that I can look into, I'm more than happy to talk to you. Um, you can Twitter DM me, you can reach me via Signal. Um, I'm, I'm always available and I'm eager to talk to folks in the industry that are looking into this because I think it's a fascinating issue. Um, and if anyone has any questions, I am more than happy to discuss. Let me just turn off my screen share there. I don't think I have any questions, but I'll leave it up for a couple more minutes if anyone thinks of anything. Um, have I published this all? Um, yeah, I have, and I can send you guys the link. Um, this is up on CNBC. It went up in mid, mid May, I guess it's been like three weeks. So I can send you the link one second. Um, I don't know the best way to do this. All right, it's hard to do all this at once. Okay. I apologize. Someone just asked me where. There's the link. I'm sorry about that. I should have given that to you guys in the presentation. Um, do you have a ballpark of how large the ad fraud problem is? Is it 5% of spend, 50%? That's a really good question. Um, and I just, to be totally honest with you, I see so many different answers to that question. So I, I don't know, I don't know what the, what the correct answer is because I think, you know, we see a ton of estimates. Um, but it's impossible to know because you can only track what you have, you know, to be fraud, right? So um, I'm just going to say I, I can give you, I can kind of point you to some estimates. And I think Global Disinformation Index does some really good stuff. Um, Gustine Food does some, you know, some good uh, research into this. But it is really, really, really tricky. You know, check the ad tech um, verification firm does, does its guesses into it, white ops, they all have different numbers, um, but it's tricky because you, I think a lot of what's done is that you sample um, a certain amount of traffic or whatever. Um, so I think it's really tough to, to put a real number on it. So I apologize that I don't really know the true answer, but I would say it is very, very prevalent and it's, it's tricky because it just, it, they keep getting smarter over time. So it's, it's, it's tricky and how it compares to other mediums. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure if you mean um, how large the ad fraud problem is. Hmm. If you can clarify that, let me know, because I'm not, I don't want to answer the wrong question. Um, 
but let me know if you can clarify that a little bit. I'd be happy to give you my thoughts. Does anyone else have any questions? Okay. Um, So I think you're asking how much spending goes to fraud as opposed to TV or billboard. I see. Okay. Um, so the, again, yeah. So, so without putting a number on it, I just don't know that I can compare, you know, for an advertiser budget, how much goes, but I would point you to, if you guys haven't seen the ISBA report that came out last month um, that talks about sort of the, the chain of where, money goes in programmatic. I think that's a really good resource and I'll send it to you right now. Um, and the Financial Times did a great story on this. So I'm going to send this in the webinar chat. Hopefully that worked. If it didn't, just look for the ISB. There we go. Um, the ISBA report, um, it just talks about how half of the online ad spending goes to middlemen, and then there's just sort of this bit of spending that we just have no idea where it goes. And, and I think we can, we can surmise that some of that goes to fraud, but it's really tough to tell. So I'm, I'm, hopefully that, that um, report might give you a little bit more info. Um, I have a question here from Bree, um, recent college graduate and will be going into digital sales and marketing. Um, is there any tips you have for starting out a new job and starting an experiment like this on your own for your company? Um, great question. Um, I think for this, so I, you know, I'm not, I don't work in the reporter. I don't work in um, digital advertising, but this was a really good way for me to kind of understand the plumbing of how this all works um, and anyone could do it. I mean, I'm really not, I'm not telling you to do something illegal, but I do think um, something like this that shows you exactly how things work is very helpful. Um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't have understood the process and sort of all the rules and how they look into this and all that stuff without doing this myself, if that makes sense. So I think a lot of companies in the ad tech world, um, you know, can, can talk about things and, and, and as probably all of you know, there's a lot of language to it that makes things sound more sophisticated maybe than, than it actually is and makes it just confusing. So I think for me to find something where this was something that was close to home because it affects the industry that I work in. Um, and, you know, it, it just, there's, there's, especially now with, you know, CPMs had really struggled um, in the beginning days of the pandemic um, for news publishers. And I just thought, you know, this is, this is one factor. There's many more factors, but, um, but this is just, this is something that I can look into myself. And so I, I would say like, you know, for anyone working in the industry um, in ad tech, like there's, there's probably 50 other experiments you could think of to do um, that kind of just show how this all works and how the plumbing works and I would say that it gives you a great um, sort of firsthand experience into how this all happens. So hopefully that's helpful. It's, I know it's not, I can't, I, I would say, you know, find a problem, find something that you're like, this is weird, and then just figure out how you can look into it or run your own experiment. But I think it's a great way to get sort of deeper knowledge and understanding of how it all works. And I'll just hold on if anyone has any other questions. Um, hopefully you guys got the link to the, sorry, I think I sent that two times, but um,
Yeah, I would just reiterate again that um, I think something like this just, it just helps kind of understand how much is at stake and how there is this just unknown. And I would just encourage, yeah, I would just encourage you again to, um, just to, just to like kind of look around and see what, what else is out there. The, the ISBA report was really interesting because it talked about one brand that was studied in the first quarter. Um, their advertising appeared on 150,000, it was about 140,000 websites. And one of them was like a, a Nepalese calendar site. Um, and you know, some of these are probably completely legitimate and some of them it's kind of, if you can look, if you look at URL specifically, um, sometimes you, you kind of have to wonder, is this real? Who would visit this? What human would visit this website? Sometimes they'll just be a, a whole string of, um, a whole string of kind of gibberish and you, you have to think, why would, I see that the link didn't pop up. Um, that's so weird. I'm sorry. If you can find this, Financial Times, the headline is half of online ad spending goes to industry middlemen. Um, and the report itself, Zoom problems. Um, okay. You should be able to find an isba.org.uk. And it's probably in their, um, you know, recent research and stuff like that. And that's to BK who was asking me about that. Another question, um, do you think the upcoming political season will be especially problematic? You know, that's a great question. I, we're, we're looking into right now um, what's kind of, what has happened specifically for political micro-targeting and things like that. But I think you're probably meaning more like misinformation and stuff like that. And unfortunately, I think, it, you know, we've, we've seen some of the platforms take action um, on some issues. So I don't know if you guys heard about that pandemic video that was making the rounds on YouTube and Facebook. Um, and it was interesting to watch the reaction because when that became a big thing, um, if I'm, I'm remembering, YouTube was kind of trying to get rid of it really quickly. Facebook at first kind of said, you know, we're going to let our fact checkers look at this. And then eventually later that afternoon, they determined the video because it said something about um, masks being harmful that they were gonna they were gonna take it down. So you see things like this, but they spread so quickly. And you know, I know that there's this whole argument right now of how the platform should be handling information like this. But when it comes to elections, I think we've in, in sort of voter suppression and things like that. I think we've seen the platforms be really, really active. Um, in making sure that that stuff is corrected. And so I don't know <laughs> how far we've really come from the last election when it comes to misinformation um, about sort of the issues themselves. Um, but I do I do think we've, we've noticed, and you guys have probably noticed, um, a lot of action to make sure that, you know, the voter, su voter suppression isn't happening, but there's still, there's just, there's so many issues still um, so it will just be interesting in the months to come. And it's, it's almost crazy that we have the election so soon because there's just been so much else going on. But, um, yeah, <laughs> it's a great question, Sarah. I, I think that, uh, I don't want to say problematic, but I just do think that there's still so many issues and we're seeing that things like this are still being supported by advertising. And I just think there just, there just continues to be more need for having a handle on where your ads are appearing and where your money is going. So it's a really good question. I think that may have been all the questions. If anyone else thinks of anything, um, 
again, just um, I can show you my email again, or I'll just write it in here. Um, I'm always around. And again, like if there's things that you guys think are worth looking into or you have a tip or, um, you know, ways of doing this differently the next time, just please let me know. And I think anyone looking into this and thinking about it, it's great because, you know, the more people kind of examining it, I think the better. So um, I just want to thank you guys for tuning in. And I just want to make sure I'm not missing any other questions. But thank you seriously so much. And hopefully this was interesting and helpful. Um, again, if you didn't read the story, I the link should be in here. And hopefully you can give it a look if you haven't. Um, and please just keep in touch. Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon.